Dr. Britton uh, earned her veteran degree from Ross University, and then she completed a small animal rotating internship at the Animal Emergency Medical Center in Torrance, California. Uh, she was accepted into a wildlife specialty internship in medicine and surgery at the Wildlife Center in Virginia. Uh, and then she completed a wildlife exotic and zoological internship at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Canada. So she's done some traveling. She completed her ABVP avian residency at the Veterinary Center for Birds and Exotics in Bedford Hills, New York, uh, right before joining the avian exotics team right here at North Star Vets in New Jersey. So um, we're proud to have her on the team. She does amazing work. Um, I always love to tell the story. We had a group of Cub Scouts come through for a tour and uh, they said, have you ever treated a, a whale? And she goes, yeah, I you know, work with whales. And somebody said, how about really small things like voles? And she goes, oh yeah, I've worked with them. And another uh, kid said, how about a gorilla? And she goes, oh yeah, I worked with a gorilla once at the zoo. And then it was on. If it was an animal a seven-year-old could name, they were throwing them out. She's like, oh yeah, I've worked with them. I've treated them. I know these guys. So she has done it all and seen it all and uh, just has a wealth of knowledge. So tonight we're focusing on rabbits, um, but she's just a, a great, a great doctor. So uh, without any further ado, allow me to introduce to you, Dr. Kristen Britton. Thank you so much, Phil. You forgot to tell them that they did stump me though. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? I, I don't know. So some kid says, how about a Tasmanian devil? And she goes, you know, I don't know if uh, there's a Tasmanian devil. So I don't know if that was true. If you were just like, you know what? These kids aren't going to stump me. End it right here. <laughs> no, I, I really haven't worked with the Tasmanian devil. <laughs> Never worked with Tasmanian devils. All right. So there's one that you got to get your hands there's on. There's one I haven't worked with. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Well, you know, uh, just a quick note, you know, someone uh, who's as great a person, as great a doctor as Kristen Britton, uh, must have great parents. And so, uh, so hand my hats off to uh, bringing uh, whoever brought Kristen Britton into the world. Uh, it was a wonderful move. So thank you for that. Um, all right, Dr. Britton, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks so much, Phil. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen here. And hopefully you guys will be able to see everything just fine. All right. So just let me start this by saying that we've got a lot of slides here, a lot of information to cover. I may go through certain things a little bit faster than others, um, but I wanted to make sure that you guys had all of the information available to you. Um, so if you ever wanted to go back to this PowerPoint, um, you won't be missing anything. Um, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So this is waiting for the poop explosion. And that's where I refer to most of my GI stasis cases. Um, when I'm talking to owners, I'm letting them know, hey, we're just, we're just still waiting for that poop to come. And once that poop explosion happens, then they get to go home. So let's dive on into this. Maybe, there we go. All right, so what we're going to start with is some anatomy here of rabbits. Uh, so we'll start with the oral cavity in regards to the GI system. So they are, ag they have agnathism. Um, so what that means is that their mandible is a little bit more narrow than their maxilla. So that when they're chewing, they're kind of creating this motion that goes back and forth, back and forth, and that's going to wear down the teeth in a certain way. That can also cause problems, however, with the teeth. If they're not wearing those teeth appropriately, we can get small points that develop as well. They don't have a very big gape at all, so they can't open their mouth very wide, um, only about 20 to 25 percent. If you think about our dogs and our cats, it's more like 60 to 75%. Um, so it's a very narrow little area that we have to go into. And then their teeth do constantly grow and they have very high crowns um, and they have uh, four incisors up top. So and two incisors here. And then these are what we call peg teeth. They're just little teeth that sit behind the incisors and then two incisors on the bottom as well. So um, that's kind of where we get all of those teeth. Um, and then your cheek teeth kind of sit right here, right under your orbit. And this is your nasal cavity. So you can kind of see how these teeth, if there's issues, there may be some um, problems with the eyes or the nasal cavity itself. So the intestinal system, the gastrointestinal system in rabbits, they are monogastric and they are hindgut fermenters. Um, so that's kind of the, the way that we start with them. Think of their GI system as very, very similar to horses. 
their stomachs are very similar to any other monogastric animal. Um, so they're simple stomachs. They are very thin walled, so much thinner than a dog or a cat would be. They do kind of secrete um, hydrochloric acid and pepsin, just like any other stomach would. And so their gastric pH though is around one to three. Um, and that will basically sterilize things that are coming into the stomach. With our juvenile rabbits, however, their gastric pH is a little bit more basic at 5 to 6.5. And the reasoning for this is so that they can actually have bacteria populate their GI system. The downside is, is that our younger rabbits are going to be much more prone to bacterial infections due to this. The big thing I want you to take away from information about the stomach is they can't vomit. They can't burp. They can't vomit. They can't regurgitate. Um, they have a very, very thick serrated uh, muscular uh, sphincter here at your cardiac uh, area. The pylorus, so kind of coming out of your stomach here at the end, the thing you need to know about that for uh, the GI system in a rabbit is that it's very easily compressed by the duodenum. So it can kink pretty easy and that can be a problem spot for rabbits. So as we go down the line here, uh, the duodenum and your jejunum and then your ileum kind of coming around. With your duodenum and your ileum, the big thing you need to know is that it is shorter and it is more narrow than dogs and cats. So that's the big takeaway there. Your small intestinal system is very efficient at getting out all of your starches and your amino acids. And that's, that's where all that digestion happens. The other thing that gets digested in this area are cecotropes. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So let's go into your cecum here. So your cecum is where all the magic happens in rabbits. So that's that hind gut and all where all the fermentation happens. It also separates out the GI content. So kind of into your fibrous things and your less fibrous things, and also kind of determines what type of feces are gonna be made. The one thing about the cecum is it's incredibly thin. It's like tissue paper when you're looking at it. It just, it, it's, you can see the cecal contents through the, the cecum itself. Um, it does take up about half of your abdomen. So most of their GI system is cecum and it'll usually sit on the right-hand side. So when you're palpating, make sure that you're feeling that right-hand side of the abdomen. They do have an appendix and that's where most of their lymphatic tissues are. So hindgut fermentation. So again, that's kind of all the magic in rabbits and why they're so different than most of our other types of animals. Their microflora is so different, it's actually genetically unique to rabbits. So they have uh, about 90% of their bacteria is Firmicutes. So Firmicutes um, is a bacteria that helps ferment cellulose. And from that cellulose, you're going to start getting volatile acids that are produced. Those volatile acids are then going to actually provide energy from your cecum itself. It also provides about 30 to 50% of the rabbit's needs um, in general. So you can see how these bacteria are so incredibly important in breaking down all of that fibrous material. So things like the hay and all the veggies and things that they're eating, that bacteria is actually what makes that material usable for the rabbit. Um, besides Firmicutes, you have some Bacteroides as well. Um, and then those big words in the Firmicutes, so you've got uh, Ruminococcaceae and you've got uh, Lactosporosi, uh, or the, those two. And those, again, they, they've just kind of uh, scientifically discovered that those are there and that they are genetically unique to rabbits. So kind of cool stuff. The really cool part of the GI system, in my opinion, is the Festus coli. So this is part of the colon, and what it does is it determines what kind of feces are going to be produced by the rabbit. So they're either going to make these hard, dry pellets, or they're going to make cecotropes. 
So cecotropes are sequel material that is softer. So the Fusis coli actually determines kind of the peristaltic waves that are happening. So when they're making the hard ones, it's one way, but it's, when it's making the soft ones, it's moving things through quicker so that you're getting those soft fecal, sequel material. So what are cecotropes and what is that all about? So cecotropes are these soft little sequel contents. So it has all that bacteria packed into it, but it's coated with mucus. And it's really important that you know that it's coated with mucus because that's how it survives that really acid stomach. So that mucus is going to help protect it from being dissolved and sterilized in the stomach and allow it to actually make it to the jejunum and the ileum where these are actually dissolved or digested and then they'll repopulate the cecum from there. They do kind of look like grape clusters. They are made uh, when you are resting. So a lot of people call these the nighttime stools. Uh, so you'll see them usually at night. The rabbits will eat them directly from their rectum. And, uh, they'll, and if they're not eating them, that can cause some problems. But this is what helps to repopulate that cecum with that good bacteria that's gonna help break down all that fibrous material that they eat. So what do they eat? Um, obviously wild rabbits, they're eating certain things out there in the wild, lots of grasses and things. But for our bunnies that are in our houses, we wanna make sure and give them tons of hay. So ideally that's their non-digestible fiber that's gonna get fermented in their cecum and go to that 30 to 50% of their energy needs. And with hay, that should be available at all times for them. They should never not have hay available. It's going to promote GI motility and helps them wear their teeth down appropriately. That nice grinding material way that they do is kind of that round motion. With hay, it helps grind things down more normally. Fresh vegetables, that's also a big part of their diet. Uh, Ideally, two cups per 2.3 kilogram, which would be about a five pound rabbit, is what's recommended. For most owners, I just tell them if you give them a salad the size of their body every day, that's, that's perfect. Uh, with the pellets, this is where they're getting some of the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that they may be missing from some of the fiber and, and the actual veggies that they're eating. So the pellets are, they're based either in Timothy hay or alfalfa in Timothy, but they also have all those added vitamins and minerals. We have to be careful with the pellets though, because most of them are put together with molasses. And so if they eat too much pellets, they're gonna get fat and it can cause some abnormal bacterial overgrowth. And so that's something that we have to be careful of when we're feeding pellets. So I only ideally want about a fourth of a cup per rabbit per day. However, some rabbits are more high energy, so they may need a little bit more. Other rabbits, like our really small guys, dwarfs and things, we're gonna have to adjust that accordingly. So haze, there's tons of haze out there, guys. It kind of takes us back to large animal medicine here. So there's grass haze, uh, which are things like your Timothy haze. Those are the most common uh, for rabbits and what is in their natural diet as well. Legumes would be things like alfalfa and clover. That's something that we usually want to save for our baby bunnies or our rabbits that are either pregnant or lactating. The reasoning for that is it has more caloric density to it. So it's got more protein, more calcium. And so if you're feeding an adult rabbit legumes, they're going to get overweight as well. The last type of hay or grain haze. Grain haze are good for in certain instances. Some rabbits really like them, but they do have these little seed holes or these little seed heads, and that is fattening for them. So if they are on things like oat hay, barley haze, they can get overweight and start to be officially obese, and we don't want them to get that way. So try to keep these at a minimum. Fresh veggies, like I said, they just kind of added those micronutrients. They are also a good source of fiber and they also have a higher water content. So in your kiddos that are a little bit dehydrated, adding more veggies in can actually help that. 
There's a whole bunch of veggies that can be given. You can check out House Rabbit Society's website. Uh, that's gonna tell you a whole list as well. But these are just a few of the kind of common things that are very safe for rabbits to eat. The one thing I want you to know about veggies though, are they're not all created equal. And unfortunately, Bugs Bunny lied to me as a kid. Bugs Bunny was eating carrots all day long. And I thought that that's what rabbits ate. However, if you give a rabbit nothing but carrots or give them lots of carrots, they are the most sugary of the vegetables. And so just like with other sugary things, it's gonna cause sequel overgrowth and abnormalities. So Bugs Bunny was a stinker. He completely lied to us. So keep the carrots to a minimum. So other things that you need to be careful of with certain vegetables is their calcium content. Rabbits will absorb calcium that is given to them. So their intestinal system will absorb it if it's offered. Calcium digestion does not, it, uh, it, it's not involved with your phosphorus. It's not involved with your vitamin D levels like other animals will be. So they will uptake all of the calcium offered and then they'll excrete it through their urine, which is a little bit different than the bile that is normally excreted with other animals. Because their calcium gets excreted in their urine, once it hits the pH of the urinary system, it turns to carbonate. And then we get urinary sludge and urinary stones. So if we're feeding lots of things that are very high in calcium, which this list over here kind of gives you some of the common ones. So for people that are feeding veggies, spinach, kale, parsley, those are the ones that are usually the ones that I tell owners to watch out for because those are usually the ones that people actually have and, and have on, on time there. So, that leads us to fruit. I had a roommate um, in Canada that gave her rabbit a little piece of banana every single day. And when I say a little piece of banana, like a half a piece of banana, he was overweight, um, but he never really had GI issues. So he could tolerate it. Now, this is not something that I recommend at all. Uh, Bananas and apples are some of the most sugary of the fruits, and that can cause a lot of problems. Sequel dysbiosis, enteritis, obesity, all of that can happen. So ideally you want to stick, if you're going to give a fruit, I only want it as a treat, like maybe one to two times a week, and it should end in the word berry. If you have a fruit that ends in the word berry, it is usually less sugary than some of the others that are out there. So with pellets, I don't want you guys feeding anything that has nuts, seeds, dried fruit, little bits and pieces to it. I only want the boring pellet. I want it to be a green, boring pellet. If you're feeding things that have the little bits in it, it's going to destroy the teeth. They're going to get dental abscesses and they're going to need dental trims and they will be overweight and have a lot of GI issues. This is a big thing. Make sure when you're getting your history from your owners, what kind of food you're feeding. If they say pellets, ask them what type. So these are just some brands that I like. Um, doesn't have to be these brands, but these are diets that are, you know, it has what it needs in it. And so either a Timothy-based hay or a Timothy alfalfa blend is what we're looking at. So now we'll go to the physical exam of the bunny. Uh, so with physical exams, you do want to kind of do everything like you would normally do with a dog or cat, making sure that you're getting a really good history. So make sure that you know what this animal is eating. Make sure that you know when the clinical signs started. Have you did your rabbit start not eating acutely or has this been something that's been tapering down for the past few days, few weeks, few months? That's gonna give you a better idea of the types of situations that you might be looking for. So make sure to get a history. That's the big thing that I wanna drive home. And then you can get your physical exam started. So we'll start with the TPR. Um, so your body temperature is actually a prognostic indicator for bunnies, especially ones that are experiencing GI stasis. Their normal temperature should be around 100 to 104. 
the study that was done in regards to body temperature prognostic indicators showed that if you had a drop in temperature that was 1.8 or more, you have twice as high of a risk of dying as an animal that didn't, okay? So temperature is really, really important. Bunnies that are coming in at 98 or lower, they need to be warmed and they need to be addressed right away. Heart rate, respiratory rate, you know, making sure that you're not hearing any arrhythmias, heart murmurs, pulmonary crackles, make sure that you can hear on both sides of your lungs um, that there aren't any sort of muffled sounds um, or anything like that. A lot of things on the physical exam have to do with the rabbit's head. So I'm gonna focus a lot on the head. So when you're looking at rabbits, you wanna make sure that they don't have any sort of nasal or ocular discharge. Rabbits are really, really great groomers, which is fabulous. However, because they groom so much, their nose may look clear to you. You may not see the snot coming down. So make sure to look at their arms because they're like little snotty kids and they're gonna wipe their arms on their nose and you'll have all that kind of crusted debris on their fur. That's what I want you guys to be looking out for, for kind of signs of nasal discharge. Otic exams, like this little guy here, um, our lop-eared rabbits do have little stenotic ear canals at that bend. Sometimes it can be really hard to get past that. And a lot of the lop rabbits will have a lot of waxy debris in there and potentially pus down in there as well. It is not uncommon to see. So make sure you do a really good otic exam. Whenever you're looking at the face, make sure to palpate the skull. And when I say palpate the skull, I want you to feel everything. I want you to feel the zygomatic arch. I want you to feel around the eyes. I want you to feel along the bottom part of the jaw, along the maxilla. You're feeling for any sort of lumps, bumps, or irregularities. These guys can get dental abscesses, little swellings at the base of the ear could be a ruptured um, middle ear and you've got a pus pocket now forming. There's so many different things that you can learn from just feeling the rabbit's face. So make sure to kind of feel that area. Symmetry of the face is also important. So you guys have been looking at this little bun here for a while and hopefully you can see that his face is not symmetrical. Uh, so his right side of his face, that lip is retracted. And that's actually the side that's wrong. It's not the side that looks droopy that's wrong. So this part right here is the wrong side of his face. So he has facial nerve paralysis and likely from dental disease or middle ear disease. It affects the nerve and will cause retraction of the lip. These are things that can sometimes cause GI stasis as well. So pay attention to the symmetry of the face. Neurologic status, so head tilts, things like that are also important. Uh, could be related to something like e you know, Make sure that you do a good orthopedic exam as well. How stable are they on their feet? Those types of things. All right, so we'll go on to our dental exam. So oral exams are incredibly important in rabbits. So it's important that you have the right tools to be able to examine the teeth appropriately. So we use either a nasal or a vaginal speculum, and that's what this is right here. It has a nice little light on it, spreads those cheeks out of the way. Rabbits have really fat cheeks, and so they get in the way of you being able to actually see those molars. So you wanna use that to spread open the cheek and be able to look at those cheek teeth there. If your rabbit is smaller, or if you're like me and might need a little bit of magnification because those eyes aren't as good as they used to be, um, you can use an otoscope as well. Um, and so this is a chinchilla. I do know that's a chinchilla, but this is just kind of a good picture of what that otoscope would look like. Just be aware that they will chew on it. And if you're using the plastic type of um, otoscope cones, they are likely going to damage that cone a little bit. Uh, you're looking for any sort of crown elongation, points, ulcers, things like that in the mouth, um, any sort of pus. Hypersalivation is another thing that you can see. And even if you're not seeing a point or an ulcer, hypersalivation may be a sign that there's actually something going on um, there in the dental um, arcade that is not healthy. 
So because these guys are not eating, we wanna make sure and assess the GI system as well as we can. So abdominal pain is a big one. So as you're palpating that belly, do we have any flinching? Where is that flinching happening? Is it associated with any gas, um, any sort of firm areas? When you're feeling the stomach and the stomach should feel nice and soft and just kind of roll in your hands, like with the rabbit standing, you just kind of roll your hands behind that stomach and take a feel of it to get a feel for its size, any sort of distension. And if there is distension, does it feel like gas? Give it a flick, act like it's a cow or a horse, give it a little flick. And if you're hearing a ping, that's that gas. And if you're hearing a thud, it might be more of um, fluid that's in there. So kind of use your large animal skills uh, with this too. When you're feeling the stomach, you also want to know how firm it is. Like, is it like clay? Like if you squish the stomach, does your indent, does your hand indent into the fe into the ingesta and it just stays there? Is it is it just really thick, or is it more doughy, or does it just feel like it's a whole bunch of fluid in there? And those would all be abnormal things to be feeling. So kind of get a feel for what what your stomach feels like. And this goes for the small intestines and the cecum as well, because these can also have those types of um, consistencies. The other thing that I want you to do is listen to the stomach, listen to the GI system. Again, treat it like a horse. You wanna use your four quadrants of your abdomen. So your right cranial, your right caudal, move to your left cranial, your left caudal. You wanna be hearing those borborygamy type sounds, those gut noises. Um, and are they going too fast? Are you not hearing hardly anything? Those would be things to kind of be on the lookout for. So with pain, a lot of people can tell that there's pain when we're palpating the abdomen, but how do you tell if a rabbit is just painful in general? It can be really difficult. So there was an actual study that was done where they gave rabbits ear tattoos and then they were assessing their pain afterwards. And they came up with something called the Grimace Scale. And the Grimace Scale is all about facial cues. So I'm gonna zoom in on this a little bit for you guys. So the Grimace scale is looking at different areas. So it's looking at the eyes for squinting or tightening. It's looking at the cheeks. Cheeks would be nice and chubby if they start to flatten out. That's a sign of pain. The nose ideally should have a nice curved U shape to it. Once it starts looking like a V, that's some signs of pain. Same thing with the whiskers. Whiskers should be kind of nice and relaxed and out. The moment that they start getting more back or more pointed, that's also a sign of pain. And then the ears, the ears kind of being upright is normal. Think of dogs that are scared. They're gonna put their ears back. Same with rabbits and pain. Uh, so these types of things are what we want to kind of be on the lookout for. So that brings us to diagnostic tests. So after we've done our exam, you know, kind of assessed our patient, how dehydrated are you? What kind of problems have we found already? You wanna do some diagnostics. Every rabbit that is experiencing GI stasis, in my opinion, needs x-rays and blood work. And I'll explain why in a minute. But doing these diagnostic tests are going to help make sure that we are not missing something really dangerous, okay? So we'll start with blood work. And this is just the basic blood work. So your, your baseline blood work of a CBC and a chemistry. So you're looking for infections. If your blood glucose is really high, that's a poor prognostic indicator. Your rabbit might be in shock if it's over 300. So pay attention to it. Elevations in your liver values, any of them with an anemia, I want you guys thinking of liver torsions. That's a big one. I want you to investigate that if you're starting to see those types of things on your blood work. In general, hyperglobulinemia, think inflammatory things, infectious things, pastorella, E. caniculi, those types of things should be kind of on your radar if you're seeing very high globulin levels too. So, x rays. With our x rays, there are lots of different types of patterns. And a lot of people have difficulties 
reading rabbit x-rays because they are so different than dogs and cats. They've got gas all over the place. They've got a cecum that's ginormous and taking up half of their abdomen. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. So I just want to kind of break it down into three main types of GI stasis that we see. So this one here is a basic stasis. So basic GI stasis is something that is not severe, probably happened over time. But what you're looking at is the stomach here. So the stomach has ingesta in it and it's ingesta. So that's important. And then you can see that there's ingesta that almost looks more bright. That's dehydrated food. So that you wanna pay attention to. There's gas around all this ingesta as well. That's a sign of GI stasis. Ideally, you shouldn't have compacted ingesta with gas surrounding it. The other thing that we can see is that there's just kind of ileus all over. We've got these weird little gas pockets in different places. So this is something that would be a general GI stasis case. The other thing I want you to be aware of is your stomach. It's okay if it goes past the last rib. Most of my buddies that are healthy, their stomachs are going past their last ribs. So don't be scared by that. What you should be scared of is this. This is a rabbit that has a proximal gastric obstruction. So much different than the previous x-ray. So we've got a very fluid distended stomach going past that last rib here and touching the ventral abdomen. That's a problem. This is a big distended gas filled or fluid filled stomach. It kind of has that fried egg look appearance. So you've got this big gas bubble of that fluid, that bubble kind of raising in the fluid when we turn the rabbit lateral. We know that that's fluid in the stomach. And the other thing that you might see with this is that you're not going to see any gas anywhere else in the GI system. There's not much else going on here. And then in the colon here, these are not little gas bubbles. These are actually poops. And so you can see that all of these poops here are just sitting here. So this happened fast. So this is a very severely debilitated rabbit. You have to think about this gastric distension causing compression of your aorta. This rabbit's probably shocky and this probably happened fast. The fluid builds up in their stomach rather rapidly. And this is all from the sodium potassium pumps that are trying to push more fluid into the stomach to try to soften up and break up whatever it is that is in the stomach that can't move. Keep in mind, these guys can't vomit. They can't get rid of this fluid. They can't get rid of this gas. And if your duodenum or your proximal, your, your pyloric area is obstructed, you're going to be in trouble really fast. So this is something that would be a very severely affected rabbit. This one's slightly different. So we still have that big stomach that has that fried egg appearance. So we know there's fluid in here and we know it's distended, not quite as bad as that last one, but still almost touching the ventral abdomen. But we have all this gas that's happening in the small intestine. Um, and so this is more of a mid to distal obstruction that's happening. So we still have that fluid buildup, all that water and fluid that's trying to fill up that stomach to help get things moving, but nothing's happening. We've got a backup of gas. So just like a dog or a cat, you're going to see that kind of gastric distension go through your intestinal system. So other diagnostics that you can do kind of depends on what you found in your blood work and your x-rays. Did you find anything that looked like a liver torsion concern? If you did, please do an ultrasound. Use color Doppler and see what's going on with those liver lobes. Or is there blood flow to every liver lobe? Or is there a liver lobe that's kind of dark and doesn't have blood flow? That's a torsion that needs to go to surgery. That's an emergency. Um, ultrasound can help you with lots of other things. It's not as great for the GI system because rabbits have so much gas associated with their GI system, um, but it can be good for urinary stones, masses, looking at the liver, those types of things. 
CT scans. So did you see some really wicked dental disease on your physical exam? You know, is that the reason that you're in GI stasis? Or did you actually feel bumps and lumps um, like tooth roots at, on your physical exam on the ventral mandible? If you did, that bunny needs a CT scan. We need to see what's happening underneath the gingiva and in the roots. Middle ear infections. Do you have a lock with a whole bunch of debris here and a head tilt? That might be middle ear disease. Do a CT scan, figure out what's going on there. Fecal parasite testing, that's something mainly for our younger kiddos. Um, things like coccidia, cecal worms, those would be the things that I would be worried about for them. Cytologies, cultures, so rabbits with nasal discharge, take a deep nasal culture of that, figure out what's growing so that you can get them on the appropriate antibiotics for that abscesses, ear discharges, culture them, do cytologies of them, get an idea of what you're actually dealing with. And then there are specialized tests like for E. caniculi and pastorella where you can actually look at titer levels and acute phase protein levels to figure out if this is an actual infection now or if they've just been exposed to something in the past. So now that we've kind of had our physical exam, we've done some diagnostics, we have an idea of what we're dealing with, what do we do? Good grief, like what, what is your underlying cause here? So do you have stasis? And if you have stasis, why? Why do you have stasis? Usually GI stasis is related to something else happening in the body. Um, but there are certain things that I wanna make sure that you guys are aware of in regards to diseases. So obstructions, this is the big one. The clinical signs of an obstruction is that this rabbit is not doing well and it very acutely stopped doing well. So it's not pooping, it's not eating, it's painful and it's lethargic. When you're listening to the GI system, you might actually appreciate more GI noises than normal. And so at the beginning of an obstruction, they'll actually move their GI system more. The most common areas for them to have a GI obstruction is that pyloric outflow tract because it compresses by the duodenum really easily, or the ileocecal junction is another area, and there's some lymphatic tissue there as well. Um, things that cause the GI stasis and the obstruction, hair mats. So not necessarily hair balls, but a little mat of hair that builds up in the GI system. And there's debate about what causes that. Either they're over grooming and consuming a lot of hair, or that hair may be packed into a cecotrope that they ate because they were supposed to, but now we've got this little compressed mat that's already been through the GI system once, and now it's gonna go through again, but it might get stuck. And these can cause pressure necrosis, these guys can be really shocky. And if these guys are not treated, they are going to die in six to 12 hours. Okay, this is very, very serious. So if you're seeing that obstructive pattern on x-ray, make sure that the owners know that this is, this is a bad thing. Liver torsion. So liver torsions are another one that you want to address as an emergency. They do come in an acute and a chronic form. Acute signs would be anorexia, pain when you're palpating the cranial stomach. It's very difficult to actually palpate the liver because the stomach's usually in the way and then you've got the ribs in the way. But if you're getting pain on that, pay attention to it. Usually these guys are weak. They can even become obtunded because of their discomfort. And you can have a hemoabdomen with this. The liver twists on itself, starts bleeding from the base, okay? These guys, they can be dead within 12 to 72 hours if this is not addressed. The more chronic form, they're more like poor doers. So they survived their liver torsion, but now that liver lobe is dead. And so you'll have like a firm, non-painful mass happening. And they're just poor doers. They're just off and on GI stasis, not quite right. The way to diagnose this, like we discussed earlier, do an ultrasound. The most common liver lobes that are associated are going to be your caudate lobe. Oh, your, volume is. <laughs> your right lateral liver lobe. Um, the treatment would be a liver lobectomy. It's actually a really fun surgery once you're done being terrified of it. Um, and these guys, depending on how much blood loss they had, can have a good prognosis. 
make sure that these guys are stable. Some of these guys just need blood transfusions before you take them to surgery. Some of them um, are gonna need some serious fluid resuscitation. So make sure that your patient's stable before you take them. Cecal dysbiosis, now this is fairly common. Um, it's usually due to a poor diet. So these rabbits are gonna have high carb diets, high protein diets with low fiber. So that's the rabbit that comes in and the owner says, oh, he only eats pellets. Um, he doesn't eat anything else. And he really likes the ones with the oats and the corn and the little bits and pieces in it. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's the one that you need to watch out for sequel dysbiosis. Um, other things that can cause it are inappropriate antibiotics. So things like penicillin given orally, clavamox given orally, or convenia given. Those are death to a rabbit that will, that will cause severe sequel dysbiosis and they are going to need hospitalized care and intensive hospitalized care. Um, clinical signs are usually going to be things like diarrhea or even clay-like feces. Like you feel that cecum and it just feels like clay back there. Um, usually they're going to have less GI noises present in a cecal dysbiosis case. Uh, calciuria and urinary stones. Um, these are things that can develop due to too much calcium ingestion. So kind of like we talked about earlier, um, the calcium builds up, we get a stone or we get this kind of hazy appearance to our bladder. They can have difficulties urinating or they can obstruct and that can be a big problem. Other thing, other causes of GI stasis I call head cases. Um, so dental disease, this is a really bad dental point jabbing into the cheek here. Um, this here is a dental abscess. So this is involving the incisors and the first two premolars. These can progress to um, fractures of the mandible if they become really bad. Um, other things too is retrobulbar abscesses. So you should never be able to see the sclera of a rabbit's eye. If you're seeing it, retropulse that eye. Can you actually push it back into the socket? If you can't, it probably has something behind there growing. Middle ear infections, upper respiratory infections, E. caniculi, all of these things can lead to GI stasis cases. So now that we know some of the things that can lead us there, how do we treat it? I don't want you going into stasis, let's treat this. So heat support, if they are below that 100 temp, heat them up, but I want you to monitor their temperatures very, very carefully um, because these little guys, they can get too hot and then you're cooking your rabbits. So watch the heat, but watch it often. Pain control, this is the bit, if there's anything that I can drive home to you, pain control is so important. Um, you want to make sure that you're taking care of that appropriately. So pain control would include things like buprenorphine. That's a really basic one that we use all the time. Hydromorphone for those that are maybe needing a little bit more. Fentanyl, do it. If they, if they are not being controlled with these types of drugs, add in a fentanyl. Um, you can do a CRI. They can really make them much more comfortable. You got to remember, they can't vomit. They've got this gas buildup. They've got this fluid buildup. It's really uncomfortable. Like if you've ever had GI gas, you know how painful that is. Think about a rabbit and how much gas that they can have. It is uncomfortable. Meloxicam, absolutely you can use it, but you have to have your blood work first. I don't want you giving meloxicam to a shocky patient that's already putting all of its fluids into its GI system, and now we're gonna hit its kidneys with, with a non -steroidal. So just be careful with it. And as long as your blood work looks good, absolutely please use it, it helps. Serenia, now why would we be giving serenia to an animal that can't vomit? because it helps with GI discomfort. It helps with GI pain. Um, they do take a little bit of a higher dose than our dogs and cats. So two mg per kg instead of one mg per kg. Um, and that can go sub Q or IV. Lidocaine CRIs. I love lidocaine CRIs. We do 50 micrograms per kg per minute. 
And that really helps not only with pain and relaxing the GI system, but it also helps with inflammation. Um, so it's a wonderful, wonderful tool to use. Ketamine CRIs are also something that are useful in that sense too. So don't hesitate to use these types of things. Fluid therapy, catheters are where it's at. Please give IV fluids. You can give IV fluids with an IV catheter, like a cephalic catheter. You can use a saphenous. You can also use an ear, okay? With these ear catheters, and I'm gonna move this because I don't know if you guys can see that or not. Um, with these ear catheters, this is the artery. It looks nice and juicy. Don't go for that one, please. Nobody wants an ear catheter and putting fluids through that. Um, what you want to go for is this little guy over here, okay? This is your vein, and so that lateral vein is where you want your catheter to, to go. Technicians, use a piece of rolled up gauze, shove it in the ear canal, tape it that way. It'll be secure that way. Um, you can suture these in if you need to, um, but usually we are taping them in. All right, so with... Um, with our fluid therapy, their maintenance rates are much, much higher than dogs and cats. And so their maintenance rates are going to be 100 to 120 mils per keg per day. That's just maintenance. Add in your percentage dehydration. And again, if they're cold, please warm up those fluids. If your rabbit is in shock, please use crystalloid boluses, shock boluses. So anywhere between 10 to 20 mils per keg per hour is usually what we're doing. You can use things like hypertonic saline and colloids. Let's say that your rabbit is so dehydrated, you tried an ear, you tried the vessels, you can't get blood anywhere. If you don't have IV access, you can give fluids rectally to these guys. Get a Foley catheter, get some warm saline, and use 15 to 60 mils per keg over about 10 to 15 minutes. It's gonna be much more effective than trying to give sub-Q fluids and waiting for that to work. Um, so that is one way and, the, and their colon basically absorbs that fluid, okay? And it'll help get them a little bit more stable more quickly so that you can get IV access. Other things that you can use are things like GI promotility drugs. So things like cisapride, um, metoclopramide, just helping move that GI system along. Some people are scared of these drugs. I definitely have worked in practices where they were not allowed to be used and practices where they are allowed to be used. I 100% want to use them. Um, these guys resolve so much quicker with them. Like they can still resolve without GI promotility drugs, but they resolve so much quicker with them. Um, and it just helps get that gas out, helps move things along. Your cisapride is going to kind of focus at your cecal motility. Your metoclopramide is mainly going to focus at your stomach and your small intestine. You absolutely can use them together. Don't underestimate the power of massage. Give them GI massages and massage that belly. Make sure that they get some exercise time too. Exercise time is something that we want to make sure that they have. Helps promote GI motility as well. Nutritional support. So we want to feed our bunnies that are in our general GI stasis kind of episodes, ones that haven't been eating well. However, the bunny that has an obstruction, we do not want to feed that bunny because we don't want to add more food into a stomach that is already distended to the max because they can't vomit. And the only way that that food's going anywhere is a ruptured stomach. Okay, so be very careful and know what you're getting yourself into. But rabbits that are in GI stasis, more often than not, are rabbits that need to be fed. Um, we usually in hospital feed them four times a day. There are feeding instructions on the back of all these packages. And these are just three different types of feeding formulas that we like to use. Um, Oxbo and um, selectives or supreme selectives are usually the two brands that we use the most. GI protectants, this is something that I don't use a lot, but they do have their place now and then. So you can use things like famotidine, omeprazole, and pantoprazole if needed. 
All right, your decompression of your stomach. Remember your rabbit that has a proximal obstruction. You need to take care of that stomach because that stuff isn't going anywhere. So if you see a rabbit with that fried egg appearance, the stomach is descended to the point where there's no return. We need to sedate that bunny and we need to get that fluid or gas off. Sedation can be anything as simple as midazolam. Some of these bunnies don't need any sedation because they are that bad off. Ideally, getting some pain control on board. So if your midazolam and your buprenorphine don't seem to be enough, you can absolutely use things like alfaxalone and dexmedetomidine. If you need to, feel free to use isoflurane. You can either use a mask or you can intubate. Um, when you're doing this, try to use the biggest red rubber that you've got um, and make some extra holes in it. Make the opening as wide as you can. Um, measure that red rubber to the last rib and that's where the stomach's gonna be. Ventroflex the neck, just like you would in a dog to kind of create that, that um, position that the tube's gonna go into the esophagus and not down the trachea. I would be very impressed if you went down the trachea. However, ventroflexion just helps prevent that from happening. You can use an otoscope comb to protect the tube from the teeth. So as the rabbit might be just sedated, chewing can happen, we don't wanna lose that tube. So protect your cone. The tube, as you're suctioning out material, keep in mind, you've got to get past that cardia, which may be a little stiff, okay? So use a little bit of pressure when you're going in, but keep in mind the stomach is also probably compromised. So once you're in, stop, get that gas out and get that fluid out. If your tube gets plugged, pull out your tube, undo the plug, go again. Um, smell is a prognostic indicator here. So if the material smells fetid and disgusting, that may be a sign that your intestinal system is dying and you have necrosis. So make sure that your owners are aware if you have some really nasty smelling stuff, this prognosis just went down a lot, okay? So don't, you know, don't candy coat it. They, they need to know. So when do you cut? This is the most common question I get from um, most of my referring veterinarians. Um, basically you need to cut if there's an underlying cause to cut. So for instance, a liver lobe torsion or a true obstruction, especially obstructions that are not improving with medical management. Sometimes that little hair felt or that little hair mat will move if we just hydrate them and give them some pain meds. However, if it doesn't and your stomach keeps filling up with fluid, filling up with fluid, and you're having to tube this rabbit multiple times, it's time. Once you're, I'm at a three strikes you're out. If you're having to tube you three times, that's enough. It's time to take you to surgery. If your GI contents aren't moving at all, if your hypermotility originally is now turning to hypomotility, those are signs that you would need to get going with surgery as well. Um, or if you can't decompress, let's say that you can't get in or you can't get the stuff out because there's too much other stuff in there or too much hair or everything gets blocked, you may need to take it to surgery. So how do we get them home? What are the steps to get you home? Basically, you can't leave until you poop. You, you are here because you couldn't poop and you weren't eating well. So this is the poop explosion. So this bunny here in this corner is looking at all of his little poops that he's made. They're very irregular, different sizes, different shapes. You'll have some that are connected. You'll have some that have really funny shapes and just not normal sizes. Usually once this happens, I feel pretty good. Make sure that you repalpate your GI system often. Like where is the gas? Where are the discomforts? You know, are we kind of out of the woods now? Is everything soft again? Are we better hydrated? Um, ideally, I want them to be nibbling at least on a little bit of food before they leave as well. And then we don't want to cut them off cold turkey. Please do send these or, um, owners home with some supportive care. So meloxicam, Gabapentin, I like doing gabapentin anywhere between three to five mix per kid, either once or twice daily for bunnies. That usually helps with any sort of residual potential gas pain. Cisapride and then syringe feedings. I want them to do all of those treatments until their clinical signs completely resolve and they're eating again normally and pooping again normally. 
Prognosis, it really varies with the cause of the GI stasis. So if you have a liver torsion with a hemorabdomen, that's a, that's a very guarded prognosis, depending on how long it's been going on. If you have an obstruction that's not resolving, that also is a good prognosis. However, the sooner that you catch these, the sooner that you diagnose these and start treating the underlying problems, the better your prognosis will be. So do your diagnostics, do them early, and make sure that owners know that if, they're, if their rabbit isn't eating for an eight to 12 hour period, that's an emergency. Get them in the hospital. So that is it, guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed this lecture. And if there's any questions that anybody has, I'm happy to take any of those now as well. Awesome, Phil here jumping back in. Dr. Britton, that was fabulous, thank you so much. We still have a couple of minutes, so uh, if anybody has a question, you can either unmute and ask it if you want, or you can just type it in to the chat and I'll read it out for Dr. Britton to read. I'll fill the silence for a quick minute while in case anyone's typing. Um, if you go to northservets.com to the social networking page, um, we have our calendar for 2022 up. Uh, we have uh, the next lecture ready to go. Uh, Dr. Um, Catherine Talaj, our criticalist, is going to be speaking about traumatic brain injury uh, on February 23rd. So that'll come up next month. Um, and then we'll go on through the year uh, after that. Um, and there's also a lot of on demand lectures. So if you need to get some credits real quick, race approved credits. Uh, there's a, about a dozen options there too, as well. All right, so, okay, have, have questions. Yeah, I, I do see a question. Okay. Um, so I, we got a question about, do you normally do x-rays on them awake or sedated? That's a fabulous question. So I did forget to mention that sometimes these guys are going to need some sedation. Sometimes even for your exam, you're going to need some sedation. So I usually do anywhere between 0.5 to one mg per kg of midazolam. And you can do that IM. And that's usually enough to take the edge off where you can do your exam and get your sedated x-rays. If that's not enough, you can absolutely use other drugs. Um, you can go a little bit higher with your midazolam, or you can add in other things like alfaxalone, um, you know, just for that further relaxation for them. So that's a wonderful question, especially with you with your x-rays. You want to get good quality x-rays. You don't want things to be kind of... Um, you know, tilted, it can kind of make things difficult to assess. So that was a fabulous question. Absolutely, we do some, we do some sedated x-rays. And then um, I've got a question as well, um, asking about the uh, colonic fluid therapy and what crystalloids I would prefer. So we'll go back to and um, the colonic fluid part. Let me see if I can move all these various things. Give me a second. So when you're giving fluids via the colon, um, let's see. You want to use anywhere between 15 to 60 mils per kg, and you want to do that over 10 to 15 minutes. And again, the best way to do it is have a Foley catheter in there so that that fluid stays where it should be. Please, please, please make sure it's warm. They, nothing would be worse than cold fluids going into your colon. Um, so make sure that that fluid is warm when you're giving it. And then as for the crystalloids that I prefer, we're usually using um, LRS. That's the most common one that we use. You can use things like Normasol, but LRS is kind of my preferred. Mm. And thank you guys for all the, the thank yous. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, let's see, it looks like we do have another question um, with young babies who are recently weaned. Um, the, you mentioned that they were more prone to GI issues due to, I believe you said, bacteria in the stomach and GI. Any suggestions on supplements or things to do to present upset in youngsters? I know I struggle with this with my own and a common issue I have with clients that call about 
raising baby bunnies or a young rabbit that they have? Absolutely, this is also a good question. So I'll kind of go back to the slide that had about the bacteria that they have in their GI system. Um, so rabbit's GI system is very specific in regards to their bacteria. So, and I'm sorry about all these things, I don't know where all those dots came from. Um, but um, basically their GI system has this type of bacteria present. Um, so Firmicutes, Ruminococcaceae, and Lacnospiraceae. Uh, um, so these bacteria are not bacteria that you are commonly going to find in your probiotics out there, even the ones that say that they're made for rabbits. All of them have lactobacillus, and guess what? They don't have lactobacillus that's found there. So it can be really frustrating. So the biggest thing that I can say in regards to the youngsters, there are things, um, Oxbow does make a digestive supportive tablet. It does have some probiotic in there. It is a hay-based tablet, so there's no extra sugars associated with it. So that's one of my favorites. Um, the other types of things that you can use are things like Benny Back. Um, Benny Back does have a small mammal that is um, kind of used for um, wildlife and rabbits and things. Again, keep in mind, it's not ideal. It doesn't have the exact things that we need, but there really isn't anything that has exactly what we need in it. Um, you know, so that's something that you can use as well. As we're learning more about these guys' microflora, new products are coming out. And so as that changes, we're going to be seeing hopefully some better options for our baby bunnies. And yes, it definitely is that the baby bunnies GI system is more around that 5 to 6.5 GI pH, as opposed to their adult counterparts that have a 1 to 3 GIPH. So they're sterilizing everything. The babies need that kind of lower P or that, sorry, that more high pH so that they can let that bacteria populate their cecum. But unfortunately, it does cause problems. And especially if you're raising baby bunnies. So like if you're doing wildlife, for instance, try to stick with things that are for rabbits or for wildlife. Don't use just like um, puppy milk replacers or kitten milk replacers. It will cause a lot of bacterial abnormalities, a lot of gas. Um, so do be cautious with those types of things too. We did have a question, Dr. Britton uh, from Tara. What is the survival rate for GI obstruction post surgical correction? So that's a really good question. And unfortunately, I don't have an official answer for that. I would need to look up some studies, which unfortunately I don't have on me at the moment. I would 